again, good evening, everyone. My name is Charlene Margo, and I am co-founder of Nonprofit, The Parent Venture, that brings you this program, the Parent Education Series, now in its 18th season. We are so happy and proud to have with us tonight Deborah Farmer Chris, who is a favorite of this program. Tonight, she's going to be talking to us about one of her favorite topics, understanding the tween age brain. Those of you who know and love teenagers will certainly learn tonight. We're all looking forward to it. So I am so excited. Uh, when I heard all the people who are registered tonight, I would happily talk to three people about a topic like this. But it reminds me that we are all in this loving our 10 to 12 year olds together, or our nine to 12 year olds. Um, and that this is a really distinct time of life that we don't talk as much about. We talk about kids and teens as if they're these distinct beings and one day they just wake up and they're a teenager, but there's this whole stage of development called tweenagehood, I call it, this early adolescence that is so distinct and so much is happening and I just don't think we talk about it enough. So that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. Just so you know, I'm in the thick of this with you. I also have two tweens um, and I spent many years teaching the bookends, that would be fourth grade and seventh grade of this age, and I love it so, so much. So, um, I love this shirt. If you have a 10 year old coming up, level 10 unlocked, official teenager, and you are entering the best of times and the worst of times. I love this age. It is not necessarily easy to be raising your fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh grader, but I hope tonight will help just a little. So, in the chat, would you, if you're not driving, just drop down at what age do you think adolescence officially begins? And I want to make sure I can see the chat. Here we go. Okay, interesting. I'm seeing lots of nines, eights, a couple tens, elevens, and twelves. All right. So, uh, First of all, that's better than um, a lot do, because I think a lot of parents, especially when I taught middle school, think that suddenly like you're not an adolescent until you're a teenager. And clearly many of you, probably because you see the signs, know that it happens earlier than that. So the stages of adolescence. Um, adolescence is different than puberty, even though they often go hand in hand and are concurrent in some ways. Adolescence is more about the psychological and cognitive development, so the social skills and identity formation that is happening. Puberty is the physical maturation towards sexual maturity. And so while they're happening at a similar time, puberty ends long before adolescence ends. So let's just make sure we have our kind of facts straight here. Early adolescence is 10 to 13. So those are your tweens right there. Your middle adolescence, which is where I think most parents often think about, is your 14 to 17. That's really your high school age. And your late adolescence is 18 to 21 plus, because we know now that the prefrontal cortex does not finish developing until the mid-20s. Puberty, on the other hand, this beginning changes in terms of physical maturation. The onset um, for biological girls tends to be 8 to 10. Uh, and it's a little bit later for biological boys, um, usually more like nine and a half, but that's earlier than we were kids, the average. Um, there are a lot of questions about why those environmental factors are happening uh, to push that onset a little bit earlier. All I know is a lot of parents aren't ready for that when they see it happening. But when you look at that overlap, is it any wonder that your 10 year old has really big feelings when you're hitting the psychological changes of age 10 and the onset of puberty usually that's the the late end of the onset of puberty that's a lot happening and i gave a presentation to a group of, of elementary school parents a couple weeks ago about emotions and when i had the question and answer 90 percent of the questions were from parents of 10 year olds i have a 10 year old too so i see this happening that suddenly big feelings are happening and we're wondering what's going on with our kid okay I, I find it really helpful for empathy, uh, to practice empathy by remembering, even when we don't want to, what it was like to be that age. So this is a fun creative writing experiment. I'll give you about 60 seconds. If you want to in the chat, in five words or less, how would you describe your 
own tweenage years. And I'll read some of them out loud for those who are driving and can't read the chat or fixing dinner. How would you describe being an 11 or 12 year old in your memories? Think back to fourth, fifth and sixth grade. What was that like? Even a single word, what was the emotion? Ah, uh, now they're coming in. All right, I'm gonna read some of these while you keep writing. Independent, naive, self-conscious, awkward, lonely, shy, fluctuating emotions, lost. Um, a large Indian family was never alone and had a wonderful adolescence. Mm, pass it on to your kid, I love that. Um, awkward, formed important friendships, successful, fun, influenced by friends, confusing, a full gamut. Lots, I, I see lots of awkwards. Um, that's to be expected when your body's changing, you don't always know why. So let's take a dive inside the teenage brain for a moment. I want you to think about babies to age three and the incredible growth spurt of the brain as they go from sitting in your arms and squawking to telling stories, running around the gross motor, the cognitive development. It is remarkable. You can't quite believe the three-year-old wasn't even on earth three years ago. I now want you to translate that to your 11 to 14 year olds. Starting at about age 11 is the second major growth spurt of the brain. So the brain is both um, adding new connections and it's also pruning. There is a wonderful Pixar movie called Inside Out where there's this uh, imaginary friend named, I think it's Bing Bong. And during part of the changing of the brain, she forgets him. And it's so painful for us watching. Even today, I was remembering a wonderful trip to my mother's house a few years ago. And every memory I mentioned, my kids did not remember, right? And that's just, I just assumed this magical thing would stay with them forever. And yes, it helped form them, but the memories start to slough off. So during that second growth spurt, and you see these huge leaps, right? You see leaps in their cognitive ability. You see leaps in their, um, in their ability to think abstractly. Uh, when you think about what a kid can do mathematically from fourth grade to eighth grade, when you think about how they perceive justice and themselves, uh, I will often say to parents of sixth graders, you know, look now, your child in eighth grade, it's it's almost like they've lived a lifetime in those three years because so many changes are happening. Concurrently with this, there's a surge of two hormones that make a really big difference in how they interact with their world. Um, there's oxytocin, we sometimes think of as the love hormone. That's the thing that makes it feel really good and connected. But that connection they're seeking is less with us um, and tends to be more with the peer group. If you think about that in terms of evolution, uh, very often at about age 11, 12, 13, you had um, people kind of sent off to live more independently. And so they needed to have a very strong peer group for survival. They needed to be able to rely on, on that peer group and to be able to say goodbye to their parents. Dopamine is that reward hormone that, you know, when something feels really good, we get that surge of dopamine and we want to do more of it. And there's a lot of new things and experiences in your teenage years, and it's it's a high. You want more of that feeling, and we'll talk more about how that can influence our parenting later. As a, Dr. Lawrence Steinberg, who's one of the um, just best um, researchers on the adolescent brain, says, in the teenage and teenage years, it's it's like having too much accelerator on a car and not enough brake. There's so much going on. But that prefrontal cortex, that risk assessment, it's not fully developed yet. So your child will likely experience, and you are probably already seeing this, heightened emotional sensitivity. Uh, especially when I was a fourth grade teacher for many years, this would be, very, I, I would see this in the classroom and then parents would come to say, my kid's having tantrums again, like the tantrums they were having when they were four like on the floor tantrums and it it's not something they've done for years and so you will see with all these body changes puberty changes the emotional sensitivity is just is is very acute 
there's a desire for greater independence. They are looking to separate more from you, but that doesn't mean they don't want to be connected to. There is a craving for peer approval in a way most kids have not felt before. There's this beautiful, amazing drive to explore new interests, hobbies, music, styles, and identity markers. I had so much fun watching my oldest from the beginning of sixth grade to now nearly the end of seventh grade change hairstyles, change musical tastes, change hobbies, uh, tr suddenly get into drama, whereas they would have never done that before, like this cascade of changes. And I was expecting that. And I was so excited when it hit because I thought, like, this is my child beginning to do that identity formation, which is so beautiful, even when it means that they're throwing out some of their childhood toys or interests that I may have had a vested interest in. The other one that you will likely see more of is a misunderstanding of risk. Now, most of you will think of that as the risk taking, say that we think about teenagers, you know, drag racing or, you know, doing something dangerous like rock climbing without a harness, that kind of risk seeking behavior, um, that stimulus seeking. But that's not the only kind of misunderstanding of risk that kids experience. The other side of that equation that you might see in your child is overestimating a risk. So overestimating how embarrassing it'll be if they mess up lines in a play and so refusing to go on stage. Um, you know, uh, misunderstanding how much um, peers are going to be staring at their first zit and refusing to go to school. And so you'll see this other side where I feel comfortable in my shell and I am overestimating a risk. And so therefore I'm gonna cling back to comforts of, of home. And so you see that anxiety sometimes begin to ratchet up. So if you have a child who may have been prone to it anyway, you might see a spike in certain types of anxiety as they hit the tween years. So as Steinberg says, the adolescent brain is it's just as exquisitely tuned to and sensitive to experience. So everything feels like it's turned way up at this age. That also means we tend to form strong memories from this age. So whereas you may have hazy memories from ages five and six, you probably have pretty strong memories from your sixth, seventh, eighth grade years because our brain is really again wired to these experiences i believe that's one reason why a lot of parents are nervous about this age because we have our own awkward memories of it not everybody thankfully but lots of us lots of us have just it's it was awkward our bodies were changing our friend groups were changing and we have strong emotional memories so when our own child struggles with body changes or changing friend groups, it can trigger an emotional reaction in us that is rooted in our own memories. So one of the tasks of this age of your teenager is to say goodbye to their childhood. And this will happen in different ways. Um, so when my oldest turned 10 that summer, cleaned out all the American Girl dolls and this really huge oversized stuffed teddy bear that their grandpa had gotten them when they were two. And I was fine with the dolls going, but that bear, like I was more attached to that bear because I had pictures of my kid snuggling that bear. But, you know, it got put into the back seat of the car and it was this almost tangible picture of saying, I want to try something else on. I'm, I'm saying goodbye to this. And then of course, on the flip side, it's the contradiction um, that I may want to put on makeup and get a skincare routine at age 10, as uh, the Sephora tweens are showing us, but I also want to still sleep with my blankie. And I also want to snuggle up and rewatch um, a, you know, a show I loved when I was five. And I want to have these moments where I really kind of regress back into even an early childhood stage. Um, I will admit that I have never read this book, but I love the title so much. It's like the iconic title for me, which is Get Out of My Life, but first could you drive me and Cheryl to the mall? I suppose I need to actually read Dr. Wolf's book one of these days, but boy, his title. 
And that's really what we sometimes see is this push and pull of even having an incredibly thoughtful conversation about, you know, a world issue and then completely losing it when uh, and wanting you to tie the shoes for them. Right. And just getting so upset when you say do it yourself. And this jumble of contradictions can be really confusing for us. And so obviously for them as well of wanting to be babied and also wanting to be independent. And that can change really rapidly one to the other. And I'm seeing some hearts and thumbs up. So you're experiencing this, that jumble of contradictions. Another thing that's helpful to know as parents is that because of the surge of dopamine that is happening, um, the kids in their tween age years and uh, early teen years are absolutely wired to seek peer approval unlike any other time of their life. Not even late adolescents have it to this extent. Um, they, they want the peer approval. And one of the things that's happened with our digital life is that it's almost like they can codify or number their approval. Like I posted something, how many people saw it? How many people liked it? How many people commented? Oh no, not many people have, should I take it down? Right, that desire for approval. And whereas in the younger years, popularity was very much based on likability. So you go to a kindergarten classroom, the most popular kid is probably one of the nicest kids in the class. And the other kids are like, yeah, we really like Tomas. He's really, you know, he's helpful, he's kind. The paradox of the teenage years is your kids may start talking about a popular kid and at the same time, start talking about how that popular kid is really mean. And at the same time, kind of want that kid's approval. And that is because the way that people get status at this age can often be dominance, right? Who's taking up the most oxygen? Um, who has the most friends around them? And so it can start this kind of frenzied pecking order. Um, and that's why being able to have that kind of secure downtime at home um, as challenge success, our, our friends up at Stanford will say, you know, these kids really need um, PDF playtime, they need downtime, and they need family time. Because what's happening socially, which is normal, and then heightened by social media, um, what's happening there needs a counterbalance. And that counterbalance is the security of home. So that even when they are kind of chafing against, I don't want to go to dinner at grandma's house this weekend. The comfort and security, the routines that we have built as parents can be super helpful when everything else in their life is like a ship on the sea and, and waving around. So that is a crash course in kind of what's going on in these years, you know, before that you know, they get to high school and, you know, they're more independent and that's a whole other lot. There are other issues once they hit the more the 14 age. At this age, it's the joy, it's the confusion, it's the contradiction, it's the growth spurt, it's the hormones. So what helps? So I have a couple strategies, a um, few strategies I want to share with you. You're not going to remember them all because our brains are not wired to remember more than a few things. So as you hear these, think of your own kids. And think of maybe one or two strategies that resonate at a gut level for you that you want to maybe try out in your home. And the first one is uh, to help them name their emotions and also don't take those emotions personally. And neither one of these are super easy, but both really helpful. As Lisa Damore, I think is coming to speak with Paradventure, writes in her book, The Emotional Lives of Teenagers, Big emotions are a feature, not a bug. And that is tweens as well. It is not a crisis when your child has a huge emotion. It's not comfortable for them. It's not comfortable for us. They, if they're, you know, very, when they feel those bubble up, where you want to begin to look is to say, do they have the coping skills to be able to work through these big emotions when they come. So mental health is not about not having these tumultuous emotions. It's much more about do they have strategies? And one of those strategies is actually just being able to name what they feel. But you know, when a, a kid, I would say a, a four-year-old or a 10-year-old, 
is feeling out of sorts in their body, a lot of times it just comes out as mad. I'm mad. And who am I mad at? I'm mad at mom. Why am I mad at mom? Because she's here and it happened at school, but mom's here. So I'm taking it out on mom. I told a story to a group of middle schoolers um, a while back, and it has to do with this thermometer. So in June of 2020, my kids had been isolated for three months, like everybody else's children. And we decided as kind of a neighborhood group that we would let our kids go and ride bikes together. It seemed socially distanced enough. So they were riding bikes. I was thrilled. It seemed such like such a lovely thing to let them finally do. And then my oldest came running in the house and up to use the bathroom and didn't come back down and didn't come back down. And finally I called up and said, are you coming? And I got the response, shut up, I'm not coming down. And I said, is something going on? And I hear, I hate you. Now, if you hear shut up and I hate you, does that, you know, feelings are rising, right? Like we don't raise our children to be disrespectful, but I took a deep breath because I know this wasn't typical behavior necessarily. So that got me curious, like what was happening to create this response? And I went upstairs, couldn't get anything out of my kid, but I looked over toward the bathroom and I saw a thermometer sitting out. And so I said, did you just take your temperature? No. Well, you know, it's a digital thermometer, so I could check to see. Tears. I took it. It was 101. And of course, underneath that anger was a very real fear. And that fear was, do I have COVID, right? This had been something the whole world was so scared of. And so, you know, I said, oh, look, your cheeks are all red from running around outside. Why don't we rest, drink some cold water? We took the temperature again. Of course, it was normal. But I thought how differently that could have been if I had matched anger for anger rather than getting curious to say, what is the emotion underneath the anger? Is my child embarrassed? Are they lonely, scared, hurt, overstimulated, hungry? I shared that story with this group of middle schoolers and one young woman raised her hand and said something that honestly, I wish every parent would like put on the home screen of their phone. I think about this quote all the time. Kendra said, I wish my parents would remember that when I get mad at them, it's almost always because I'm stressed about something else. And for these tweens who don't have a sophisticate, as sophisticated an emotional vocabulary as the later teens do, and who are feeling these big emotions, it's often going to come out reactively. And what we need to remember is when we see that reaction, it's almost always because they have a stress response about something else and we just happen to be that safe person in the room with them. So there's actually a term for this, um, being able to talk about your emotions with precision, and it's called emotional granularity. Um, and that's simply knowing the difference between I'm furious versus I'm angry versus I'm annoyed, I'm frustrated, I'm agitated, I'm a little bit peeved. Furious and peeved are very different emotions, but for kids, it's sometimes zero to 100. And so being able to talk about different levels of emotion that, you know, you're happy, sad, mad, and scared, but then you have lonely, which is a little bit different and overwhelmed or astonished. And sometimes even being able to help them understand their own temperament so that if they're surprised, you may have a child who's energized by surprise. I have one of those. You may have another one who's really uncomfortable with surprise and changing routine. I have one of those too. You know, as a teacher, I could have kids if I said, hey, we're uh, gonna have a surprise guest today who would get really excited and those who'd get very, very nervous because a change in routine was difficult. If you have a child who is autistic or introverted or, um, you know, just is, is a little bit more on the, had some anxiety, surprise can lead that way. And being able to kind of teach kids to talk about that, you know, I now have one of my kids who can say, oh, I need my recharge time. Actually, they like to say, I need my introvert time. 
like after a big event, because there's a self knowledge that comes. And so instead of going to a big event, coming back home and getting really irritated or me forcing my child to generally join a big family dinner, I understand and they understand that they need some time with their music alone in their room before they're ready to once again re-engage. That's good for me. That's good for my child. That's a level of awareness that tweens can begin to build because again, with their cognitive growth spurt, they are understanding the world better than they were before. Um, why being able to name feelings? Because it turns out that just naming a feeling can help draw down the emotion. So that, um, you know, I was with one tween the, a couple years ago who was really mad at their friend. And after we deconstructed it, she realized she was jealous that her friend got a better score on a test. And once they could name jealous, she wasn't mad at her friend anymore. It was like, oh, I get it. I'm more nervous about myself. So strategy number two, which goes along with this, this is an age, the tween years, where you can teach them more about their brain. And it's empowering because we don't teach it enough. Like what's actually going on up there in our brain? So one of the most important things I like to teach tweens about their brain is how their brain responds to stress. So very simplified, we've got this amygdala. It's designed to help regulate um, our, our body systems and our response to threats. So if a tiger comes charging toward us, we're not supposed to think rationally about how fast it's moving and calculate velocity. We're supposed to get out of there or play dead or whatever is going to keep us alive. So when our brain is having an instinctive stress response, right, we perceive a threat, we have these three common responses. Uh, that's empowering for kids to know that sometimes this urge to fight, like I'm really stressed about my math test and I want to punch something, hopefully not your sister. Um, flight, I'm really stressed about, um, you know, uh, what my friend said at, at recess. And so I'm just going to run away. I don't want to hand, I don't want to deal with the situation. I'm, I'm going to just go and flee. And then I'm going to freeze up. I, I, I'm more, I, I get into a test situation and I'm just going to freeze and my mind goes blank. From an evolutionary standpoint, all of these make a whole lot of sense, right? To protect us. And I try to teach tweens that stress isn't your enemy right? It gets you ready to go. Um, you don't want to be too calm before you go into the championship game. That adrenaline can help you before you audition for a play. But if you find that every time you sit down to work on science homework, you are fighting or wanting to flee to either YouTube or under the couch, or you're freezing up, then stress isn't being your friend anymore. And you've got to find a way to like tone down the stress response. What's great about that is it's not, it makes it so there is some ownership. It's not that I have to fight. My body is saying, my brain is saying yes, but I can calm it down and say, okay, that's not the response I want. That's not going to help me to, uh, you know, deal with my math homework tonight. So there's this great phrase um, actually taken from a school counselor in Texas where she says when a student comes and they're really upset, she says, we got to settle your glitter before we, you know, figure out a solution here. And so I like to think of a glitter jar that you shake up. Um, and I have a bunch of these around the house, forgot to grab one for tonight. And that's like your brain that's having a stress response because you're not thinking clearly. It's kind of like your prefrontal cortex, it goes offline. Think about the catastrophizing a kid goes to. First, it's just that, you know, they're upset about something that happened to school and suddenly they have no friends and all the teachers hate them, right? It goes from here to here. And we try to reason with them because we know our 11 year old is reasonable. We have heard them argue so thoughtfully, but when they are feeling this, there is no reason. You got to calm down that first. So the other night I had a kid who was a meltdown mess for a number of reasons. And I started to make the mistake of reasoning. It was getting worse. And then suddenly I just stopped and I just started to talk to myself and say, you know what, Deborah, 
he's really tired. It's been a long weekend. He's overstimulated. Why don't you just get him in a bath? Like water always helps this kid. Helped him when he's a baby, helped him now. And lo and behold, after a lot of grumbling and a bath, like the glitter settled and we could talk it through. So everybody's glitter settles in different ways. It's helpful to know your own kid. It might be running around. It might be that cup of tea. It might be listening to music. But when you try to solve the situation when your tween is activated, you are going to have a power struggle. So if they get in the car and they are furious about something their teacher said, resist the urge to call the teacher right away because once they've had a snack, they might see it very, very differently once their glitter settles. The other thing that I teach kids and I remind myself is that often we have that big emotional response, partly because it's physiological. We're hungry, we're overstimulated, we are we need more rest more sleep or we need to move our body right some exercise sometimes helps um and and these are questions that are worth asking at the end of the day if your kid is consistently coming home upset from school do they need a stack is it an overstimulating environment do they did they get enough sleep last night have they moved their body um and sometimes that's enough to kind of get your tween um to you know to re-regulate but this is also good to teach them so that they can begin to regulate themselves, because I feel like much of our tasks as parents of tweens is to help them develop the strategies they'll need when things get even harder when they're teens, meaning when the stakes are a little higher and they're even more independent and they're not coming to you as much. So they're at an age where they're more receptive to hear you talk about how hangry is a real thing or what the body feels like when it's overstimulated, or why sleep can help re-regulate the nervous system. And then again, that's, that's empowering because then they can do something about it. And kids really love learning at this age. That's one reason I love the tween age is that when they're not really stressed out, they're actually sponges for learning more about themselves and their bodies. Come back later. Uh, strategy three is um, focus on the positive. And what I mean by that is do you remember how the adolescent brain, um, it's, it has that extra dopamine, right? And so it's, it really wants pleasure. I mean, it's a drive. It really wants to feel good things. It wants to hear the song over and over again that makes them feel good. It wants to um, have that experience with friends that makes them feel good. So they're much more motivated by that than they are by fear of pain or consequences. But think about how we parent. Often we'll say, you need to get sleep or you won't do well on blank tomorrow, right? We think about the negative consequence, thinking that it's motivating. It's much more motivating and research bears this out if we can come up with the flip side, which is what is the potential pleasurable thing that will happen if they do this? So let's say um, they have a big game tomorrow. You know, uh, did you know that athletes who have at least eight hours of sleep have a better response time? Um, and this is true, like, you know, they have better response time for hitting the ball. That might be more motivated to your super sporty kid than simply saying, if you don't get sleep now, you're gonna be really crabby tomorrow, right? They can't imagine that, but they can imagine how good it will feel to hit the ball in baseball the next day. So the more we can to, you know, I mean, think about how motivated they are to like impress a new friend or somebody they have a crush on, right? That's huge motivation. Our job is to try to think, how do we tap into that? And I, I learned this kind of the hard way where I was reminded this summer, it was like two days before school started, um, my incoming fourth grader had a project that they had not started. It was just a simple getting to know you project. And it just became an absolute emotional meltdown. And I was trying to appeal to you know, he kept saying, I'm not going to do it. And I was saying, is this really how you want your teacher to, you know, to be introduced to you? And I don't care, you know, so all of my gimmicks, my, like your reputation with your school falling flat. But then we began to talk about as we brainstormed ideas, once the glitter settled, you know, about doing a project about um, something to do with, with NBA basketball. And he said, oh, I know more about this than a couple of my friends but they love basketball. They will think this is so cool. And suddenly he ran inside the house and spent hours working on this project because he was motivated by the possibility of pleasure in a way he was not motivated by 
you know, getting a good grade on the assignment. Uh, and when you think about pleasure, another way tweens get pleasure is that even when they start to pull away from you, they really love to know that you are their biggest fan. Um, and so John Gottman and the Gottman Institute, oh, looks like I missed one of them, the magic ratio. Well, I'll just talk about it. Basically, they found that for strong relationships, you want to make sure you have at least five positive interactions for every negative interaction or for, you know, constructive criticism. This can be hard when kids are in the talk back stage. This is particularly challenging for our kids who have um, neurodivergence. I'm thinking about kids of ADHD who are uh, one expert, Sharon Saling calls it like death by a thousand paper cuts. You know, where are your shoes? Where's your binder? Where'd you put this? Have you finished this? I can't believe it. Did you misplace that again? And they begin to see feedback as just like um, something that is suffocating. And so these tweens, while they're testing their limits and their emotional and they're trying to separate a little bit from you, anything you can do to be like, you know, I try to think of like before bedtime, when I go up there, like one was one thing I can say to my kid that I'm proud of them from today. The other thing I love to do is let them overhear it. So I might like be on the phone with grandma and say, oh my gosh, I wish you could have seen so-and-so in the play. It was amazing that they worked so hard in studying their lines. I'll do that sometimes in the car pickup line with their teacher strategically. I'll do it with a neighbor. I'll do it with my partner so that my kids can overhear the positive. Um, because that is what they need to build up that confidence at a time when, you know, their their internal confidence be really begins to be more fragile um, during the tween years. And then this is just at this age so helpful, which is to practice reflective listening. Because when they come to you and they're confused or they're upset, instead of trying to solve it, we can say things like, I can see why you're upset or frustrated. You know, if that happened to me, I would be worried too. I'd be confused too. I would be upset too. This one is from Lisa Damore. I love this. It's simply, that stinks. How do you want to handle it? What I love about this phrase is that it does two things. That stinks, or some version of that stinks, shows empathy. Like, I hear you. That's no fun, right? Like, your friend called you a name at recess. Like that stinks. How do you want to handle it says, I have confidence in your ability to handle it. And for tweens who are looking to be more independent, that is a huge boost. So, you know, um, they're upset because they left their homework at school and it's a meltdown. Yeah, that stinks. So how do you want to handle it? Right? Maybe you can, I could jump in with my ideas, but they're tweens. So you know what they're going to do? They're going to reflexively Think they're all stupid especially if they're activated how do you want to handle it enables them to begin to say okay what are my options here again they may need to settle their glitter before you get there but that puts it in their court which is so important for for tweens and then i like this i noticed because it allows you to notice even difficult things in a way that is positive like i notice you haven't been as excited about soccer practice recently you might be noticing something that perceive as negative, but you're saying it lovingly. And so it's a positive because you're saying, I see you, I've noticed this. And so it's not a judgment. It's just something I've seen. They may talk to you about it now. They may not, but either way, they know their parent is paying attention. I noticed you seemed pretty upset after school today. I noticed you've been frustrated with your little brother. Thank you for being so patient. Um, I use thank you a lot as well. I, I find when all else fails, it's like, even with little things like, thank you for getting your water bottle out of your backpack, right? Like sometimes we just need that reminder that we're all trying um, and the little thank yous can add up. And the final one, which is short, is that at this age, as they start to pull away from you, um, even though they love you dearly and they need you still, this is the perfect time to reinforce the village. Because one of the reasons I love tweens so much as a teacher is they really want adult approval still. 
Um, and so even if they are kind of slamming the door in the face of mom or dad, they still want that teacher or coach or drama director or aunt or uncle or grandma or grandpa to think they're the coolest. And so, you know, this is a really good time to solidify those relationships, to go out of your way to try to, you know, FaceTime that relative who lives somewhere else, to connect with the coach who your child seems to be connecting with, to connect with a teacher or a guidance counselor. Um, if you are seeing even bigger issues, you know, to connect with the mental health professional, but to get that village so that you don't feel like you're going into this alone, but more importantly, so that your child knows that in this changing time of my life, I've got, I've, I've got my people, I have people surrounding me. Um, because that's adolescence right there. There is no real plan, but that is the reality of lots of ups and downs but the reward are these amazing kids of ours. And I like to leave with a little bit of, of hope always. Um, and there's this wonderful study out of Harvard on parenting tweens and teens. And I gave all these different great strategies, but they found that parental warmth, meaning our love, had an amplifying effect on every other strategy. So even if you're not sure what to do, if you care and you're there, that amplifies everything else we are trying. So I'm going to stop sharing here so that I still have some time for Q&A. Oh, thank you so much, Deborah. That was wonderful. That was just wonderful. You know, I've heard you more than once, as you know, but I learn things every time. And I've been doing this for more than 30 years and you make it, you make it sound so doable for parents. And we appreciate that. A lot of love for that. All right, we have wonderful questions coming in, but first I'm gonna start with my own question because I get to do that. I want to know what got you interested in teaching and studying teenagers other than your own? Oh, because that's where I started um, my teaching career. So I actually was certified elementary, but then I, my first job ended up being a seventh grade at a K-8 school. And then I went back to fourth grade. And so I kind of bounced for a long time there and I was always struck by just what incredible, brilliant, warm people these kids were, even when there was so much going on. I just felt like it's just such a ripe, beautiful stage of development. I think that's really nice. My kids went to a school that was grades four to eight. And it turns out that was a really nice grouping because it was sort of like the bigger kids could help the little kids and they didn't grow up quite as fast. Yeah. That was nice. All right. Um, here's a great question. How do the things that you've talked about tonight vary across boys and girls? So not as much as you would think um, in terms of basic principles. Um, and, you know, I'm always struck that, um, you know, you have many of the things in terms of wanting to, to, to get, you know, to, to separate or have these big emotions, they're the same. But culturally, boys are often given the sense that sharing their emotions, particularly ones that don't feel quite as, you know, boyish, right? So, you know, anger is more acceptable than sadness. Um, in, and that may not be true in your family, but those are messages kids are getting. Um, and you also then, of course, have all kinds of messages trickling down to teenage girls um, about what their body should look like and you know what attractive is and so as much as you may even want a super egalitarian household there are all kinds of messages just bombarding our kids which is why keeping the lines of communication open i mean i find that i at least three times a week i am pulling some article from the new york times to be like so can we talk about this you know with my tweens right like we are we are talking about uh, about you know drugs and alcohol we are talking about Basically, you should read 14 before 14 conversations before 14. It's a great book. It's perfect to our tweens. You know, we're having conversations about very real topics about, you know, drugs, alcohol, sexuality, growth, um, you know, AI, all of this, because we can't pretend that they're in a bubble. So, you know, you may be surprised by having a very emotive son, but who feels like he has to shut it down. You may be surprised by having a very, very angry girl who feels like she can't be angry at school, so it comes home and she's angry at, at, at home. 
Oh, really good points, Deborah. I remember when my daughter was a, an adolescent kind of early on, and we were just starting to get the neuroscience in about the brain development, and how long it takes. And I remember her saying to me, oh, thank God, I thought it was going to be like this forever. <laughs> yeah. It's it can be really like comforting to realize. Yeah. I mean, I say to my seventh grader all the time, like, you're rocking seventh grade. Do you realize how many people dread seventh grade? Do yeah. you realize that this is like everybody's at your And it's just, it's kind of that we laugh about like the seventh grade curse, right? Because yeah. I think it's helpful to recognize that it's, it's, it's zooming you out. You're not just stuck in this tunnel. It's like, this is a stage. It can be an amazing stage. It can also be hard and that's okay too. Yeah, absolutely true. Thank you for that. Okay, so here's a question that came when you were telling this story about your son on the day when he was upset and thought he might have COVID. Question is, is it okay to be disrespectful just because you're mad? Is it not important to start learning, controlling emotions? Yes and yes. Um, I mean, so it is not one of the really key lessons for tweens is that every emotion is okay. There are no yeah. bad emotions. We will not punish. I, I don't punish my kids for being mad. But what you choose to do with your emotions, that is the part that you, we have to be working on in training. So being mad is not an excuse to hit your sibling. Being mad now, in the heat of the moment, when things, my job is to start to bring them down a bit, right? Like I, if all I'm doing in that moment is saying, stop being disrespectful, it's like, saying calm down to a person who's really upset doesn't usually help them calm down mm -hmm. so a lot of those conversations about what do we do when we're mad because calling names is not okay in this family you know we can set the it's it's important for them to know the values of your family right like we don't call names in our family i know you did and you were mad but that's not something you know being able to set those those limits but you also got to recognize sometimes that if you have a child who's in the middle of a meltdown, which will happen sometimes unexpectedly, um, one of the things first to do is be able to make sure they're not hurting other people and they're not hurting themselves. And then can we calm them down enough that then we can have that conversation. And that is an important conversation, but they may not be able to hear you. So that's a circle back conversation as well that has to happen. you know. And one of the things I will sometimes say to a kid post a meltdown is, that probably didn't feel very good, did it? No, yeah. right? Um, you know, I don't think you meant, you know, that's not like you to say that to me. Did, did, you, did you really mean that? No, mom, I didn't, right? It's like almost letting them self-correct versus me piling on, on the shame while also saying, yeah, we don't do that in this house. You know, and sometimes even if a kid is just throwing attitude, I might just say something like, ouch, right? I'm just gonna give you the signal that, yeah, that, 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 that was crossing a line and let them do some self-correcting. But that's a great question. Yeah, this is not about letting kids walk all over or do anything. We, part of our job is to t help them not become the people who are at the office throwing things because they didn't get their way. Like learning how to manage emotions is as important as learning how to read and write and do your arithmetic. Absolutely. And, you know, parents, again, we are the experts in our own children. And sometimes it's up to us to know them well enough to be flexible. It's like I started my career in early childhood, and we were taught that you cannot discipline a child who is tired or hungry or sick. And I think those rules apply across the board to tweens and teens. Yeah. Yeah. It's like Iran McGann, who's our communication expert who does the parent forums, will say, parents, you've got to lower that charge yeah. before you can communicate with your kid because up until then they can't hear it. And like you, know, you said, I, your son had to wait until he could hear you. Absolutely. And I the, the slide I skipped over because I didn't think I'd have time. I, I, I took you know my kids to Disneyland for the very first time. They'd never been to California before. Oh, that's know. right. Hey, everybody. <laughs> uh, and, you know, the very last night, the very last thing, uh, the lightning pass was Space Mountain. We got to the very front after 30 minutes and the ride closed, uh, right? Like I'm seeing this uh, big emotion from this very disappointed child, but I'm tired, right? So I'm, you know, when my child's like, this is the stupidest vacation ever, I'm just trying to rationalize, like think of all the fun things we did. And it's actually my older child who says, mom, I, I, I think maybe he just needs something, to, let, like let's get him something to eat and like calm down and then we'll figure it out. And I'm like, oh, this is actually where it's helpful that I've actually raised a child who can remind me that maybe we need to 
to take a break and get somewhere quiet that's not overstimulating and then figure out what to do. Um, so I, I'm amazed at the times my kids remind me of my own, like these own principles. And that's always like the feeling of like, wow, they're telling me to take a deep breath. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. All right. So many good questions coming in, everybody. Let's see how we can do. Um, this is a really good question. Person says, love in the presentation. This is for the end. Is it possible for a 14 or 15 year old kid to still be such a late bloomer? A tween? Oh, that what you've said today about tweens still applies to them. Absolutely. You know, it's, all developmentals are averages. And so, you know, as ki kids were like, oh my gosh, my kid wasn't walking until this age and we're doing these yardsticks. You know, you're gonna have some girls menstruating at eight and some when they're 16. And, and the truth is, as they're maturing, if their body matures a little later, then they're going to be maybe some delays and in, in, they may have, have been able to put off some of the things. You know, every child's different. and. You know, it's that's why middle school is so fascinating is you see kids at such different emotional and physical states of development. It all rounds out in the end, but from 10 to 17, people go at their own pace. They really do. So absolutely, you're going to see shades of this behavior all the way through. I think that's fair. And, you know, you can remind your kids about Leo the Late Bloomer. You remember that book? Mm-hmm. Same kind and, of you know, and, Developing earlier has its challenges. Developing later has its challenges. It all has its challenges. And, um, you know, that's why they need us to be there loving them. <laughs> that is right. All right. Here's another great question. I know this is not your area of expertise, but let's have a whack at it, Deborah. How does ADHD affect the development of a child's brain and what strategies can we employ to support them? Oh, big, beautiful question. Yeah. Um, can I point you toward my, one of my favorite resources? Sure. Um, there's a book called uh, What Your ADHD Child Wishes You Knew is by Sharon Saline. Um, maybe Bev can look that up and put it in there. She's the one I referenced who talked about, um, you know, where the death by a thousand paper cups where kids with ADHD rather than five positive to one negative are often 20 negative to one positive. Um, so ADHD, you know, because of some of the impulse control uh, that can be inherent there, um, there can be sometimes some social cueing that can be difficult when they hit tween age years. Um, sometimes, you know, they might be having some behaviors that peers are not reacting as, as well to or, or teachers. And when they're more self-conscious, they may be conscious about it in a way they weren't before. So there can definitely be emotional, neuro emotional ramifications to, um, you know, any type of neurodivergence because you're so aware of being different. You're so hypersensitive of being different in any way uh, that, you know, being really thoughtful about pulling that village together, um, you know, getting the right people and supports in place, but really just showering these tweens with like positive emotional support and feedback. I mean, I remember Sharon's telling me when I interviewed her, she said, I had a mom say one day, she was really trying to get her five positive and she said to her teenage son he'd actually showered right and said you your shirt smells good today because <laughs> she's like i had to i was looking for anything and it's like you're praising not just the end you're praising the process right it's like yeah maybe they didn't empty their whole backpack but they brought you the water bottle awesome they brought you the water bottle and you know there's going to be so much emotional stuff for them and this is also a time you want to be in touch with the teachers because you know, um, as they hit this growth spurt, sometimes their their needs in school change. So whatever plan you had in place for them might need to be tweaked as they hit the tween years. Thank you, Beth, for putting that in there. And, you know, you've mentioned that it's hard to stay positive. So, again, we don't have very many minutes left together, but this is a good question. The writer is asking about how can you talk to kids and use phrasing that's not so negative? even when they're mad. You've given us some suggestions, but anything else like phrases that you really like, Deborah? Yeah, so I like the I notice because it takes my judgment away. So you'd be like, you know, I, I notice you're really struggling right now. You, you need to, but even that just gives a little bit of emotional distance. Um, 
you know, there's a picture book I wrote and it's for the younger ones, but it's an impulse that I still use with my, my tweens. And it's called, I love you all the time. And so the refrain of it goes, I love you when you're happy. I love you when you're sad. I love you when you're scared. I love you when you're mad. I love you all the time. I think it can be easy for kids to think I'm lovable when I'm happy. Mm -hmm. And I think being able to say, you know, when your kid says, I'm so mad at you, you can be like, it's okay to be mad. I still love you. And I don't think they can hear it too much, right? It's like, my love for you is not contingent upon how you are feeling at the moment. I can, you know, I can, I can put a curb on your behavior if I need to, right? But I love you when you're mad. I love you all the time because you're my kid and that's my job. And so they're going to push those boundaries and be like, hey, you know, if, if I do this, are you still going to love me? And the answer, as hard as it is, has to be overtly yes. And I'll tell you one great thing. The best part about technology, if your kid does have a phone and they don't need one, um, but sometimes the memes and the texts are the way to be able to send that that little note of how proud you are um, and in those quiet ways. Sticky notes on the, uh, the, you know, on the bathroom mirror, another great way. Just a little note in the lunchbox. You may not do it all the time, but a couple times a year they might never say anything about it, but they saw it. We sometimes have to get creative about just showing that I'm your number one fan, right? You're growing up so well. I'm so proud of you. I know this isn't easy. And I just, I'm just so glad you're mine. And you know, they don't forget. I think about my own daughter now who is in her early thirties. And when she comes by, she'll leave sticky notes for me. I love you all the time, mom. And I think, you know, if you do it right, they come back and they give it to you, right? So, Deborah, we have come to the end of our wonderful hour together. What final words do you want to leave our parents of, and caregivers of tweens with today? Oh, it, you know, they're having taught the full range through high school. This is a small stage of development. But it's one where if we can really shower them with that love, like it'll return to you again and again and again. So take a deep breath, gather your village. But this is a really precious time in their development. Perfectly said, Deborah. Thank you, everybody, for being with us tonight and all the kind comments and all the great questions, which we wish we could have gotten to everything. But the video will be available soon. Deborah Farmer, Chris, thank you for your thank wisdom. You. Your love, your humor. Take care, everybody. We hope to see you again soon. Good night.